Hello everyone, this is Socrates coming at you with a very popular subject, how to grow a small account day trading options. This is the no-nonsense guide to obtaining consistent profits in the stock market. And so if you're not following me already, go ahead and give me a follow, like and subscribe. My Twitter handle is Socrates94. And there I post daily trade ideas, education, tips, and much, much more. I've also attached a School of Athens Discord invite where we just talk futures, stocks, options. We do it all. And I just want to start by saying I am not in any way licensed to give financial advice. This is not financial advice. You know. Options trading incurs the risk of substantial loss of capital. You can lose every dollar you put into an options trade without proper risk management. All strategies discussed should be refined in a simulated account before risking any real capital. No strategy is going to work 100% of the time. And I just want to reiterate, I am just a philosopher, not a financial advisor. So let's get started. A couple things I assume about you if you're watching this video. You're a newer trader and you're eager to learn. You have a brokerage account and you know how to use it. You can buy and sell. You know how to place orders. You have a small account under PDT. You have a basic understanding of options and options Greeks. You have a basic understanding of candlesticks and you can identify support and resistance. You have some experience but lack structure. And if you're still confused about any of these things, I've made a supplemental lecture YouTube playlist, and I'll put that in the description. So what do we need to get started? You know, people ask me all the time, how much do I need to get started? Well, let's be honest. Are we going to turn $10 or even $100 into $500,000? Probably not. So let's be realistic. We want to start with at least, I would say, 500 at the least. 500, 1,000. Ideally, you want to start with two to five thousand, but I know not everyone has that. It doesn't matter how much you start with, just as long as you start. But just know, the smaller you start, the harder it is to upgrade. And you need a brokerage account with options trading enabled, a cash account. We'll talk about that later. And you need the first one to two hours of market available to trade. So in Eastern Time, that is 9:30 a.m. to 11:30 a.m. And you need some kind of way to look at charts, either through your broker, TradingView, TrendSpider, Robinhood, uh, not really. Positive attitude and patience, those are key. And shameless plug, I use TrendSpider's smart trading software for my charting and most of the charts in this presentation. So I've attached my affiliate link. Go ahead and get a 20 cent percent discount off any plan. I wouldn't promote it if I didn't use it myself. If anyone follows me on Twitter know that I'm constantly posting charts using Trend Spider software. So why trade options in the first place? Well, we can magnify our gains and we can make large percentage gains on small moves. We can trade large cap names for a fraction of the price. We can trade Tesla. Amazon, Google, Apple, for just a fraction of the cost that it would be to trade shares. And with options tradings, there are infinite possibilities and strategies for any kind of market. Large caps are also easier to chart, and the technical analysis holds up better, much better than, you know, shit coins or penny stocks. And when you pay attention to large caps, you begin to understand the market much better, how it ebbs and flows, the giant web of it all. And you get unlimited day trades in a cash account. This is a PDT hack. Now, if you don't know what PDT is, PDT is the pattern day trader rule enforced by FINRA and the SEC. Accounts with less than $25,000 may only make three day trades in a five business day period. What is a day trade? The purchasing and selling or the selling and purchasing of the same security on the same day in a margin account. So if you buy one share of Apple and you sell it the same day, that is considered a day trade. 
Traders who have fa failed to obey this rule may risk being flagged, receiving a margin call, or even having their account frozen. Don't mess with the SEC, guys. Now, most people don't have $25,000 to start with. How do we avoid PDT? Well, easy. Trade in a cash account. Now, some of the benefits of having a cash account. No pattern day trader rule. This means unlimited day trades as long as we have settled funds. And when do our funds settle? Well, with options trading, our funds settle the next day. And so that is T plus 1, trade plus 1, compared to equities in a cash account that tr settle two days after the trade is made. So, for example, if we buy a contract of Apple for 125 and sell it for 150 in the same day, you cannot trade that money again until it settles. The next trading day, you will have $150 cash settled, ready to be traded with again. So, another example. Say you have $1,000 in your account, and you divide it into 10 trades with $100 each. Now, that's a lot better than three day trades in a five business day period. That gives us a lot more wiggle room. And just watch out for good faith violation. You can only trade with settled funds. If you cannot sell when you want because of PDT, then your risk to reward is automatically flawed. Now, at the time of writing this, Robinhood does not support options trading in a cash account. And then if you want a Weeble cash account, I've attached the link. And when prompted, choose cash account. Don't choose margin. Choose a cash account. And then I've also attached a link if you want to switch your Weeble margin account to a cash account. And that process took me about a week, but it was definitely worth it. And when you get this account, dedicate this account to solely day trading. No overnight swings, no long-term holds or investments. Keep your accounts separate. You have a long-term account, you have a swing account, and you have a day trading account. This is our day trading account. This is important. We keep the account separate so we can track the efficiency of our strategy. Let's have realistic expectations. Don't expect to get rich quick. Will we turn $100 into $100,000? No. I'm going to be honest with you. You're not. Not yet, at least. We have a lot of work to do. We need to ignore the parabolic gains we see on social media. And, you, know, you see those YouTube thumbnails. How I turned $100 into $5,000. It's just really unrealistic. We want to play defense, not offense. Most traders, when they begin, are lucky to break even the first year. So be defensive of your capital. And we want to trade to trade well, not to make money. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but money is a byproduct of good trading. So focus on refining your trading. And you have to think. You know We're up against the sharpest minds in the world who have advanced education and resources that far surpass our own. It can still be done, but it's a long and difficult road filled with emotions, heartbreak, euphoria, and thousands of hours of practice. Don't expect to get rich quick. And avoid small account challenges. I know you guys have all seen these. $100 to $50,000 challenge. Usually, those are just marketing schemes to get people in their chat room. Most encourage poor trading habits. They're over-risking. They're full-porting taking lottos you know the trader doing the challenge they can take the loss but a new trader can blow their hard-earned money and we don't want to do that how we trade our small account will be how we trade our large account so we need to build good habits now because they're hard to fix later practice makes permanent we take responsibility for our own money don't put faith in anyone else and don't take any alert that a trader calls a lotto Find a good trading community. Find a group of experienced traders to bounce ideas off. This is very important. Make sure they're supportive and teach traders how to fish and not just give blind alerts. That's not going to help you. Be cautious of alerts. Take responsibility for your own capital. There's nothing wrong with taking an alert, but just make sure you agree with the thesis and you trust the trader giving the alert. Do you know what they're thinking? And if you do take the alert, you don't have to wait for them to give the entry or the exit. 
you know, it's your m trade. Once you take the trade, it's your trade. The money is in your hands. And find a successful trader who doesn't mind helping new traders and don't be afraid to ask questions. Fintwit is a great place for this. That's largely how I learned. I found some great traders. You know, I messaged them and I asked them, you know, what's working for you? And they got back to me and I learned a ton. And, you know, be sure to thank someone who helps others. It is rare to find genuine people these days. So just a quick new review of options. I know these are all kind of beginner things, but we're going to be speeding up very quickly. So an option contract is an agreement to buy 100 shares of a stock at an agreed upon price by a certain date. And the strike price is the agreed upon price. For example, a 122 call. Options magnify gains and losses. A call is betting the underlying stock will go up. A put is betting the underlying stock will go down. Now when we buy option contracts, we multiply the price of the contract times 100. For example, if the contract reads 125, you'll pay $125. And then, this is very important guys, we're not exercising the shares. We're only trading the premium on the options contract. If you exercise the options, you may end up purchasing 100 shares of the underlying stock and you could result in a huge net loss. We don't want that. We're just trading the premium. Some basics on options groups. I don't really want to go into them, but they're here. So I'll give you a second to screenshot that. It's going to be in the supplemental YouTube playlist. So, you know, you really want to understand your Greeks. But that's a whole lecture in itself. So we'll move on. So account killers. So we've got Dexter Morgan here on the right. Not only did he kill hundreds of people in the Miami metro area, he also killed his day trading account. How did he do that? Holding on to losers, hoping they break even. Following too many furus, in too many chat rooms. Listening to the opinions of others. Trying too many strategies at, strategies at once. Not honing in on his own strategy. Or having no strategy at all. Taking random trades, random entries, random exits. Having no plan. He also let losers bleed to zero. And he didn't take profits when he had them. He was greedy. Account Killers Part 2. Too many open positions. Think, if the larger markets go against you, you can lose a lot of money very quickly. I speak from experience. I would say two to three trades open at a time maximum. Think, if you're in... Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, QQQ, all at once, Roku, AMC, PLTR, and, you know, spy knives, we get some bad news, you're going to lose a lot of money very quickly. So don't overexpose yourself with too many positions. Averaging down on losers. You know, in my opinion, averaging down is for investors and swing traders, not day traders. We don't average down on options. Either you're right or or you're wrong. Refusing to learn from mistakes, not journaling trades, not back testing the data. Revenge trading, going bigger to recover losses. Say if you're down a hundred dollars on the day and you think okay well I'll just go double my position size and make that back and then some, you're just gonna dig your hole deeper. And he had no risk profile and he traded chop and trading chop guys that's just death by a thousand paper cuts some people are good at it but for right now on our stage we do not want to trade chop at all and I see a lot of accounts like this two steps forward three steps back a healthy P&L should look like this consistent wins and small losses on Monday this trader made $150 Tuesday $100 Wednesday gave a little bit of gave a little bit back but really not much. He's still up on the week. Thursday, they made those losses back. And Friday, they took a small loss. So overall, they had consistent wins. And the wins were bigger than the losses. But most traders that I speak to that are new traders, their P&L looks like this. Two steps forward, three steps back. See, on Monday, they made 120. Tuesday, 80. Wednesday, they gave some gains back. Thursday, they recovered some of the 
losses. Friday, they lost $3,000. They blew up their account. You laugh, but it's true. You see it all the time. People say, oh, I gave back all my gains on the week playing Lotto Friday, playing zero DTE on Tesla Lottos. Come on. Stop this. Sorry, that's my cat. Penny. If you're up on the day, risk less as the day progresses. Defend your capital and never let large gains turn into huge losses. So never give up more than 40% of your profits. If you're up $100 on the day and you start and you lose $40, just stop right there. If you're up $1,000 on the day and you take a losing trade, now you're only up $600, stop. Walk away. You don't want to give back more than 40% of your profits on the week, on the day, on the month. And how you do that is you develop a risk plan. And this isn't something, you know, I can tell you, but you have to figure out this for yourself. You know, what X amount are you going to risk of your portfolio on a trade? And hold yourself to this. What risk to reward ratio will you aim for? With the 2 to 1 ratio, you only need to be right 40% of the time to be a successful trader. Calculate your ideal position size so that if your stop loss is hit, then your account will not dip below X amount per day. Risk management is the most important skill any trader can have. So I've written up an example plan for a $2,000 account. The max position size is 200. So we want to look for trades with a 2 to 1 risk reward. So we're going to risk $20 to make $40. And we only need to be right 2 out of 5 times to be profitable. And Ideally, we want to aim for 1% a day. So more about the 2 to 1 risk reward ratio. Say you have a 60% win rate. Say you are right 3 out of 5 times. You take 5 options trade each day with $200 positions, each with a profit target of 20% and a 10% stop loss. If you are right 3 out of 5 times, then you can make $80 a day and four hundred dollars a week. Now compound that. Albert Einstein said compounding is the eighth one of the world. Is that easy? No. Is it doable? Yeah, totally. I don't see why not. If, you, if you're not being careless, with a forty percent win rate, like we talked about, you only have to be right two out of five times to be profitable. You make twenty dollars a day and a hundred dollars a week, four hundred dollars a month. And then keep doing that as your account grows. Risking small, winning big, losing small. Taking small wins, taking small losses. You can be wrong more times than you are right and still be profitable, but the losses must be small. And then just a quick tip. I know I said, you know, three out of five trades per day. Does it mean that you have to look for five trades a day? You know, if a trade isn't there, don't take it. Don't force yourself to find a trade that isn't there. You know, some days you'll make zero trades. Some days you'll make two trades. Some days you'll make seven or eight. So it all should, you know, even out in the long run. This is just a rough general guideline. You want to follow this risk plan. You don't want to take random trades with random stop losses. And, and then when you think you're ready to size up, you think, okay, I've made $500. Let's make... Let's double our position size. Don't do that. Just don't. You're not ready yet. The first three or four times you think you're ready to size up, do not. Slap yourself on the wrist. Keep yourself disciplined. Okay. Very popular subject. People message me all the time. What stocks to trade? Well, we need a watch list. We need to create a universe of stocks that we look through every day to find potential setups and so for a small account these want to be cheap stocks cheap and liquid we'll get on to that later and we'll do a manual scan of these stocks every night see I've got my watch list over here on the right this is my trend spider watch list and we want to find what is near support and at resistance 
we want to look for stocks at key levels. What could bounce off or break support? What could reject or break out of resistance? What has earnings? We want to keep it limited. Stick to a few at first and learn their personality. So I've made a list of stocks for small accounts. And these are all liquid and they have tight bid ask spreads. No penny stocks. And so ideally, some of these are better for different size accounts, but generally these are some more cheaper names. But ideally, you want to be able to afford three to four contracts of whatever you're trading so you can scale accordingly. So, you know, we've got Apple, Microsoft, the Qs, you know, that's the NASDAQ, the SPY, which is the S&P 500, Ford, IWM, DraftKings, NEO, SoFi, etc., etc., and these are just really good names to trade. You know, you're not going to have a problem getting in or out. What stocks to stay away from? Penny stocks. Don't ever trade options on penny stocks. Come on, guys. They're rare, rarely liquid, hard to get out of. Also, stocks with low volume, wide bid ask spreads. You know, I was trading DDOG the other day. Terrible stock with terrible spreads. I'll never I'll never do that again. That is on my do not trade list. You also want to have a do not trade list. Stocks with expensive premiums. Tesla, Amazon, Google. You know, these contracts usually range from over five hundred dollars to, you know, two thousand dollars. And at this stage we can't afford that. If we lose, we're gonna lose big and we can't afford that. So my suggestion is to stick with big tech. You know, if you have like a $2,000 account, trade Apple, Microsoft, QQQ. If you have an account under $1,000, trade cheaper liquid names like F, Lucid, PLTR, Fubo, you know, stuff like that. Stuff that is cheap, but also easy to get in and out of. Stuff that the charts really hold up. Also, don't buy far out of the money contracts just because they're cheaper. You know, if it goes against you. You're gonna lose bigger you know I hear people say oh well I have a small account but I just buy the Tesla 2000 call so come on man you know that's almost like a hundred percent from what is at right now so don't do that that's just cheap if you can afford either you can afford the appropriate contract or you can't be honest with yourself so yeah we want to find stocks at key levels on the daily chart Go through your watch list each night and identify potential setups. What is sitting at key levels? What's at support? What's at resistance? These stocks are likely to either bounce or break down the next day. They're likely to have a big move the next day. And those are going to be our prime candidates for day trading. So we want to nail down these setups on the higher time frames. We can look on the daily chart. We can look on the 60 minute chart, the four hour chart. It has to be from a broader view though. And we want to find a couple bearish and bullish charts for however the market opens up. So we have ideas of what we want to play. See this chart here, a firm. See how it's kind of on its last leg of support here. It closed right here at this low. So I'm going to be looking to buy puts the next day if that level gives even further. And I made this a while ago, and I did end up taking that trade. It tanked like 12%, so that was an awesome trade. You know, if we see stocks that are going to break support or they're going to break above resistance, those are going to be ideal candidates for day trading. We don't want to trade stocks in ranges. We want to find stocks that have room to run that can make a large move. So here's another example of PLUG, and PLUG is actually another example of a great stock for a small account. So is ChargePoint, Blink, and you see how price has reacted twice before to this area. So it was resistance, turn support, now potentially going to break that support so we can look to see if it'll either bounce or break down off that support but it closed under so I'm more inclined to look for puts on this play and I think that stock did end up breaking that support
but that is a good example we know if it breaks the support on this larger time frame on the daily time frame that it can get a large move another thing I like to do I like to look at trend lines on larger time frames so a downtrend break that's one of my favorite setups if you follow me on Twitter I post it all the time it's kind of my bread and butter play you need at least three points of the trend line to connect and you want to find stocks that are near the trend line resistance if they break above the trend line resistance a breakout could ensue and then vice versa trend line break for puts you know we've got one two three four and then it en ended up breaking this trend line and ultimately heading lower and then keep in mind that the more times a support or resistance is touched the more likely it is to break through that level we also want to play what's hot where's the volume what has interesting news catalysts where's the mob and what is the mob the mob is the majority of buyers where are they looking to park their money for the day you know if big tech is absolutely ripping and you're playing some junk like piton you know what are you doing you're missing out on the hottest plays of the day don't go against the trend of the day you know counter trend trading is a little bit more advanced and we just want to ride the coattails of big money so trade the trend don't try to go against it sail with the wind you know if big tech is ripping like I said before spy is just on a tear and you're shorting some biotech junk stock you're not utilizing the market in a way that could be more profitable we want to play the stocks that are hot what's got volume liquidity let's talk about the hottest times to trade you know the market oh sorry <laughs> the market open is obviously the hottest time to trade you know this is where institutions are trading day traders are trading this is where big money moves happen and that's gonna happen in the first two hours from 9 30 a.m. Eastern Time to 11 30 that's where the most volume and liquidity is and then another thing the last hour of market is called power hour from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. that's also gonna be very liquid where institutions are looking to either add or take off risk of their positions so there's also a lot of moves that happen in power hour but really I would just stick to the open for now you know lunch volume lunch volume is just really not there low liquidity your chances of success is just a lot lower Fridays are a lot lower volume as well I'm not saying moves don't happen because obviously they do but your chances of success the most opportunity is at the open you know we trade for freedom we don't want to sit in front of a screen all day and burn our eyes you know also do not trade during economic data events this includes FOMC CPI Biden's giving a speech Powell's giving a speech know when these events are and have attached an economic calendar avoid chop at all costs and you know those CPI events the economic events those are typically going to be the market is waiting to see what an important person has to say what data is coming out how the market is gonna react so the markets might be fearful you know there might be some chop so just try to stay away from that you know so every week map out what economic events are important and try to kind of avoid those play in the direction of the trend look to buy calls in an uptrend and look to buy puts in a downtrend we need to consider the structure of the chart on longer time frames so you know if the stock is an uptrend it's got higher highs and higher lows you know don't be trying to short this similar for the bear trend lower lows lower high lower low lower high you know look at what happened with you know Roku or PayPal people who try to catch that knife they thought it was bouncing here no that was just a lower low that was just shorts getting out of their positions now the lower high is formed and then it's gonna shoot down again so be careful with you know trying to catch falling knives be careful trying to short incredible strength
sail with the wind. And yeah, try to avoid ranges, stocks that are trading sideways. We want to play stocks that are clearly going one way or the other. If you can't tell, then the play is really not obvious and it's probably a trade you shouldn't take. So we've got our technical patterns. You know, that's a whole lecture webinar in itself. But, you know, here's a list of things that you will need to memorize. You know, bull, bear flags, ascending wedge, falling wedge, channels, cup and handle, head and shoulders, double, triple bottom, support resistance, supply and demand zones, market structure, why cough. And then I've attached this graphic. You know, I'll give you a second to go ahead and screenshot that. What I did when I first started. I actually put these as my phone wallpaper and my desktop wallpaper so that every time I opened up my computer or my phone I was looking at these patterns I was internalizing them and I memorized them that way candlesticks you want to memorize your candlesticks but then keep in mind with candlesticks you know the names of the dojis aren't all that important but what matters is what the candle is telling you Who's in charge, buyers or sellers? Or is it indecisive? But yeah, you're going to want to memorize all these basic patterns. And we want to play stocks that have a tight bid-ask spread. Now what is a bid-ask spread? So the bid is the price at which the buyer is willing to pay. The ask is the price at which the seller is willing to sell to let their contracts go for. And the spread is the difference between the bid and the ask. So we always want to trade stocks with tight bid ask spreads. Stocks with wide bid ask spreads may be illiquid and hard to get out of. And if we carefully slap the ask, it can result in starting out at a net loss. For example, if the spread is, you know, 10 20% and you need to exit immediately, you'll be forced to take a 20% loss. So don't trade anything with more than a 5% spread, ideally even less. And here's a hot tip. You can put in a limit order at the mid price. And what is the mid price? It's the average of the current bid and ask prices being quoted. But there's no guarantee it'll get filled. All right, so day trading options. Trading weekly options. So most day traders who trade options are playing weekly, weekly contracts. And they kind of have a bad reputation. You know, they're risky, they're gambling, extremely volatile. It just depends on your risk plan. If you treat it like a casino, then yeah, it definitely is gambling. But if you have a proper risk plan in place, then you can stand to make a lot of money. They are extremely volatile, so you have to adjust your risk to reflect that volatility. We always want to choose liquid contracts with high volume and a tight bid ask spread. And the stop loss must be tight. We can't let trades bleed to 40, 50 percent loss. You know, I see some people they think, oh well, it's down 60 percent. I'll just risk the last 40 percent. It's kind of a poor trading mentality. And then here's a tip: after Wednesday, grab next week's contract. So if it's Thursday morning and you want to play SPY, you can grab next week's contract to avoid or to minimize at least your theta exposure. And buy the appropriate contract, like I said before. Don't be cheap trying to save a couple bucks because you'll probably end up paying for it in the long run. So a couple things I look for personally in an options contract. You know, every trader is going to be different, but... You want a stock that has at least one million in volume, at the least. I mean, that's you know still cutting it pretty thin. Ideally, like five million in volume, and the has high options volume. That's the number of transactions, probably over a thousand. We want high open interest over one thousand, and the open interest is the number of contracts being held at one time. We want a delta over point three. You know, even point two five would be fine. And that we want a tight bid ask spread so we don't want to go too far out of the money personally I prefer slightly out of the money or near out the money if spy is trading at 434.9 I 
I'm going to grab the 435 call. You know, keep it simple. If I'm trading SPY, Apple, Microsoft, I'm just grabbing the nearest out of the money strike. And then, yeah, so a misconception. So high open interest does not necessarily mean bullish or bearish. It just means that there's more liquidity to get in and out of a position. You know, some people said, oh, well, this PLTR contract has got 30,000 open interest. That means it's, you know, it's going in the whatever direction. Not necessarily true. You don't want to think like that. Just it means it's more liquid and easier to get in and out of. And then things like, I'm going to be honest with you guys, when I'm trading SPY, Apple, Microsoft, I don't look at this stuff. Just being 100% honest. You know, I might look at the IV and the spread, but these names are liquid. You're not going to have a problem getting in and out of SPY, you know. So, yeah, like I said before, this is SPY right here, the options chain that I have pulled up. So they tend to be very liquid, and they have tight bid ask spread. So the, the difference between the bid and the ask here is only $0.05. Cents. So an options land, that's $5. That's not bad. You know, we can live with that. IDEX here. We all remember that one. This has an illiquid option chain. So say we wanted to buy the two, the two put. The bid is forty-one cents and the ask is one oh nine. That is a huge loss. I think I did the math wrong here, but yeah, you if you had to exit immediately for whatever reason, and you were forced to sell at the bid after buying at one oh nine, you'd have to take a massive loss. So you don't want to do that. You always want to check the bid ask spread and now like I said liquid names you're not gonna run into that so why trade illiquid names at all let's look at another option chain so PLTR the stock is trading at 1102 and say we wanted to go short we wanted to buy puts well let's look at the 11 put right here so the bid is 51 and the ask is 52 cents there's only one cent difference between them. It's only one dollar per contracts. That's that's awesome. That's great. And look, look at the open interest here. Three thousand six hundred seventy-eight. It's a very liquid contract that meets our requirements of over one thousand. So this would probably be the contract if I would be looking to buy if I were looking to buy puts on PLTR. So yeah, like I said before, be cautious of zero DTE. And what is zero DTE? That is zero days until expiration. You know, I think many of you have seen this picture before. He's riding on the bike. He's a new options trader. You know, he falls down because <laughs> he's playing weeklies and he says, options suck. Why are they so hard? You know, it's really not the bike's fault, but his own fault. And you know, options on zero DTE are extremely volatile and dangerous if you don't have a risk plan in place. So why are they dangerous? The time decay rapidly diminishes the value of your premium very quickly. This includes Lotto Friday, which is very popular on social media. So when we play zero DTE, we want to use less size. And we have to adjust our risk to reflect this volatility. So if you are risking 10% to make 20%, but if you're playing zero DTE, you may want to adjust to 20 risk 20 percent to make 40 percent. Does that make sense? You know, and the, the stock moves sideways, just get out. The Fed is going to burn you. It's going to kill your contract. Okay. So we want to check our watch list every morning, 30 to 40 minutes before open. And what I do, I'm in my Weeble here. For anyone asking. I want to sort by pre-market gains. So I'm in the pre-market and I'm looking at what stocks on my watch list for small accounts are getting volume and that are getting some attention. You know, I can sort by pre-market gains or I can sort by volume. We want to see what's getting attention, where's the mob for the day, the majority of buyers. And this will give us clues as to what sector's leading and we can look for opportunities there. Ideally, we want to look for stocks that are gapping up 1 to 2%. And we also want to check the stocks that we charted the night before to see if they're getting any kind of movement in pre-market. So yeah, 
once we identify what stocks are getting some attention, what stocks on our watch list are gearing up to make that move, that rip, that run, or that that breakdown, we want to go ahead and mark our key levels. This is a spy chart here. So we've got price reacted twice right here. So I drew a horizontal ray. You know, price is re reacting to this level. So I drew, drew another horizontal ray. This is another level I was watching. This one as well. This lower low. This, you know, bottom trend line right here. And this bottom level right here. So we want to go on the hour chart, 65 minute chart, whatever, and mark our key levels. And these are going to be levels that we risk off of. So, so far we've identified stocks at key levels in larger time frames. We've identified what stocks are getting volume in pre-market and we found where the mob was. And we drew our support and resistance levels and we formulated a plan. Now we look for day trading opportunities. Now keep in mind, what may work for some, what works for me, might not work for you. Might not work for everyone. So it doesn't matter how you day trade as long as you know you back test the data and you're consistent with it. So you know what's most important is that we have our risk in place. And we found stocks at you know key levels. And we know how to choose a contract. So right now I'm gonna go into some of my personal strategies, but you know, you absolutely should use what works for you. So I play orbs. <clears throat> and an orb is an opening range breakout. This indicates sentiment for the day. So you take the first two candles and you draw a line at the high and one at the low. And when it goes through either the high or the low, that's going to tell you what direction you want to go in. So we found stocks at key levels, and so we want to play the orb at open. And why do we play the orb? So we don't get faked out. You know, you don't want to slap it open. I always wait at least either the first six minutes or the first ten minutes. Now, if the stock or the spy has gapped up or down, you know, 2% or 1%, you might even want to do a 30-minute orb. You know, wait the two first 15-minute candles. So we'll be observing the opening range at market open. So for like a six minute orb, the opening range are the first two three minute candles. 10 minute orb is the first two five minute candles. And then we'll be using our nine EMA as a guide. Keep in mind, it's not gonna work 100% of the time. This is only gonna work on stocks that are trending. So Longs are good to hold as long as above 90 EMA. Shorts are good to hold as long as below 90 EMA. But you, you always want to factor in support and resistance, which is more important. So sometimes the first attempt to break through the orb fails, and the second time is money. So yeah, play this on stocks that gapped in pre-market and have great volume, and are sitting at key levels, the ones that we mapped out the night before. So here is an example of the orb. We drew a line. This is all pre-market here in the gray. This is the open. So we drew a line at the high of the first two five-minute candles and one at the low. You know, we'll call the the line at the high the opening range high. We'll call the low the opening range low. So we want to wait for five-minute candle confirmation. See, like right here, it went below, but the candle didn't close below the orb. So we want to close below the orb and that's where we'll buy puts and our stop loss would be like somewhere maybe in the middle here or if it ever reclaimed the 9 EMA here so the great thing about the 9 EMA it measures the strength of the trend so this the strength of the trend right here is pretty strong so we're good to hold as long as the 9 EMA holds so when the 90 EMA closes above, or yeah, when a three minute can, five, sorry guys, <laughs> when a five minute candle closes above the 90 EMA, we can exit our positions. But you know, trim somewhere in here, you know, you know, down by here, you're definitely up over 100%. You know, you don't want to get greedy in case it reverses on you. So if you're up 30, 40%, lock in half of those gains. And then you can leave a runner 
and then exit the position once it reclaims the 9 EMA. And yeah, always be aware of support and resistance, you know, if there was like a level somewhere back there, you know, that was acting as support, that may be our target or somewhere where we want to scale out before we get there. Six minute orbs. Now, for if you're a beginner, I recommend five minute orbs, but if you're a little less impatient like me, you can do a six minute orb. So we've got a trend line break in pre-market. So we'll look for the orb. We drew a, a line at the high, a line at the low. So it went below the opening range low, and we have a three minute candle confirmation below. So we're gonna enter right after the candle confirmation into puts. Then our stop loss would be if it reclaimed the 9 EMA. Now the 9 EMA with the three minute chart is awesome because nine divides into three, three divides into nine, whatever. So mathematically that makes sense. So the 9 EMA is here in the yellow. You know, we're good to hold as long as we're below the 9 EMA. So here it closed above the 9 EMA. So we take our profits. This wasn't a huge profitable trade, but I wanted to put that example because they aren't all going to be, you know, supernova home runs. And we don't want to do that when we're building our small account. We just want to go for base hits. You probably still got 20 or 30% off this easily. And, you know, when you're up 20, 30%, lock in half those gains or just take them, you know? Don't be afraid to take the money and run. So here's an orb to the upside. This is also a three minute orb. This is a trade on Roku. So we drew a line at the low of the opening range and we drew a line at the high of the opening range. So price broke through, we had candle confirmation, but then it actually went down and it kind of rejected the orb, but it never hit our stop loss, which would have been under the 90 MA or close under BWAP, maybe like somewhere in the range here. You know, just be sensible about your stop loss. So if we're still good to hold because our stop loss was never hit, you know, we can ride the trend, ride the trend. You know, this candle looks kind of bearish, so I probably would have taken some here. But if you want to follow the strategy to a T, you take half of your position off when it closes below the 9 EMA. But what if we want to ride the trend a little bit longer? See this purple line? We can add a 21 EMA. And that is a little bit slower momentum. So we took half off when a three minute candle closed below the 9 EMA. So when it closes below the 21 EMA, we know, you know, we can probably get out and take our profits. Okay, here's another 10 minute orb. This was on Lotto Friday the other week on X. And this trade actually, you know, this is a supernova trade. You know, if you follow the strategy to a T, you know, this went over a thousand percent. So, you know, we draw a line at the top of the opening range high. We've got our candle confirmation. You know, you don't have to wait for confirmation. I think it's a little bit safer. Sometimes you can just slap right if it as it breaks the orb, but you just got to make sure that your stop loss is in place and you're ready to sell in case it goes against you. So yeah, we rode the 9 EMA up and it closed below the 9 EMA right here. So that was a huge trade, you know, from 2486 to you know 2610, somewhere around there. You know, on Lotto Friday, it's gonna be huge, huge bucks. And here's a cool strategy. The 9 EMA crossing the VWAP, and we'll talk about the VWAP in a little bit. But the once it crosses below, you know, we can go short and we're good to hold as long as the 9 EMA holds. You know, and you know, once it pulls back, we can even possibly enter again, but we could have stayed in this trade the whole time because it never reclaimed the 9 EMA. So when it reclaims the 9 EMA, we can get out and take our profits. So yeah, the VWAP. If I could only trade with one indicator my entire life, it would definitely be the VWAP. And what is the VWAP? It is the average price the security has traded at throughout the day based on volume and price. 
So EMA is only considered price. VWAP considers volume and price. And this is where big money moves happen. If you called your broker back in the day and said, I want a thousand shares of Apple, they say, okay, well, I can guarantee you VWAP pricing. So this is what institutions use. This is where big money moves happen. This is why it's a favorite among day traders and algorithmic programs used by institutions. See, this is the VWAP over here. This white line is kind of smooth. See how it bounces, bounces. So VWAP will act as support and resistance intraday. Above the VWAP is bullish. Below the VWAP is bearish. So, you know, you could have taken calls right here on the VWAP. You know, scaled out, took your profits. And then look for another bounce. So, in my opinion, for new traders, VWAP is probably the best place to make an entry. You know, you have orbs or VWAP. You know, if you master those two setups, you can make a lot of money. And VWAP is a magnet to price. Price will always go back to VWAP. So yeah, the VWAP is smooth. And then new trading day, you know, a little more dynamic. And then become smooth again. So see how price reacts. You know, it's not always perfect. You know, it'll go a little bit below. You know, we can catch bounces, we can catch breakdowns. Here it's kind of ranging, you don't really want to be involved in that. Here it's ripping and running. So the VWAP is an awesome day trading tool. My favorite. So here's an example of JD. So we could have taken calls right here. We could have taken calls right here. You know, and you just go for base hits, you know, just little scalps. 10 15 percent trades even five percent you know you know in options world you know ten percent of your two hundred dollar position on your small account is 20 bucks if you do that once twice that's 40 bucks in a day you know that's 200 bucks a week so this is easy you know the VWAP is a magnet to price see it'll rip and run come back to VWAP and then here, I wouldn't pay attention to much over here because that's when institutions are buying or selling their positions at the end of the day. So, you know, just use it, you know, kind of after the first hour, maybe first half hour, you can maybe catch a midday bounce. And then, yeah, let's go back to EMA. So EMAs, you know, they're the exponential moving average and they measure the strength of the trend. So we don't buy based on EMAs, but we can use them to stay in a trade and ride the trend. So the 5 EMA is very strong momentum. That's for scalping, very short trades, in and out. The 9 EMA is going to be a short-term trend, and you can ride the trend to get the most out of a trade. And the 21 EMA is going to be the pullback support. So any further than that, day trading, I'm not really going to get into that because we're just looking for short scalps. I don't like the scalpers who go for like 1% to 2% like options trades. You know, that's fine if you want to do that, but we want to get, you know, a little bit more out of that. So let's talk about some scalping techniques that I personally use and developed. So what is scalping? So scalpers take advantage of short moves for small gains. And they often trade high frequency. They're in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. They masters at reading price action. They can be in a trade for a few seconds or even a few minutes. Now, some of the drawbacks of scalping is, you know, you have to sit in front of the screen all day to collect small gains. You know, you have to be extremely disciplined to do that. And, you know, if you're not disciplined and you let one trade get out of hand, you can erase all your gains on the day from just one trade. So here's a couple scalping techniques. So we talked about the VWAP. The VWAP is this blue line right here. So let's combine the VWAP with the 5 EMA. So a couple conditions must be met to take this trade. So the 5 EMA has to cross up the VWAP. It has to be above the VWAP. And keep in mind, we're in a one minute chart here. And a one minute candle close above the VWAP and 5 EMA while the 5 EMA is above the VWAP. 
There we can take calls and we can ride the short term momentum. What's our exit going to be? When a one minute candle closes below the 5 EMA. You know, we could have made 10, 20, 30% on here, you know, depending on what contract you got and how close it was to expiration. And then we're going to look for a VWAP bounce. So what I like to do for a confirmation on the view up bounce, wait for a one minute candle close above the five EMA. So like here it went below VWAP, but you don't want to buy right there because the five EMA is not also below VWAP. So whatever way you're going against the VWAP or with the VWAP, you want to make sure that the five EMA is also in the direction that you want to play. So here we look for a VWAP bounce. We've got the one minute candle confirmation above VWAP. So we go along here. We get calls. You know, we can trim some around here. And then here is our take profit. You know, on a one minute candle close below VWAP. And here we've got a short entry. See, five VMA cross below VWAP. We've got a one minute candle confirmation, so we'll enter right here. And now our stop loss is never hit. So we can stay in the trade. Now, what's our stop loss? Oh, my battery's running low. So our stop loss is going to be, you know, maybe a one minute candle close below VWAP and the 5 VMA. So here, short is going to be above VWAP. That's our stop loss. One minute candle close above VWAP and 5 VMA. So we were able to stay in this trade because our stop loss has never hit. So we can ride this short term momentum and then we can get out here on a close above the 5 EMA. Make sense? And keep in mind that's a very aggressive strategy. You can do the same thing with a 3 minute chart but with a 9 EMA. And that might be a little safer. You know, if you're using the scalping technique, make sure you have your hotkeys enabled and that you can get in and out, in and out fairly quickly. So the VWAP 5 EMA crossover with the 9 EMA and RSI plus 50. Now we added a couple of things here just to increase our odds of success. So you know we've got two EMAs. One is the short term momentum and the 9 EMA is going to be a little bit less strong momentum. So if we want to get more out of a trade we can use the 9 EMA. And we can also use the RSI plus 50. When the RSI is plus 50 and breaks through the view app, that means there's momentum. Okay, so we've got a one minute candle close above view app, so we can enter right here. And we ride it, and when it closes below the 5 EMA, we can take half our position off. And then our move our stop loss up to break even. or if it closes below the 9 EMA, whatever happens first. So in this case, when it closed below the 9 EMA, we were actually in more profit. So we took some half here and then took the rest off here. So that was a great scalp. You know, if you're trading SPY, QQQ, or uh, you know, you're trading futures, that's a great technique for small gains that happen relatively quickly with an easy system. And yeah, your stop loss is gonna be, you know, below the view up if it fails that so yeah here you know we've got hidden RSI divergence and you can go ahead and google that RSI is up over 50 and then here we look for a view up bounce and but we want to make sure that the candle is above the 5 EMA so we take that long and then we ride it until the 5 VMA cracks. One minute candle close. And make sure you guys, you wait for the candles to close. You know, you you can see it go below. Like see here, it went below, but it didn't close below that level. So wait for the candles to close. Hold on. And another thing guys, keep your charts clean. You don't wanna have too many indicators. You just wanna have support, resistance, maybe a 9 EMA or VWAP, you know, eliminate the noise, have only two or three indicators max and use them well. See, like this chart here on the right, it's got too much going on, too many trend lines, Bollinger Bands, 
you know, Fibonacci. You can't really get an idea of what's going on when your chart is too busy. So keep your charts clean. And let the SPY be your guide. When it comes to trading, SPY is our North Star. So always have that chart pulled up. You know, most stocks move with the SPY because the SPY is the top 500 companies. So that is the market. When people refer to the market, they're referring to the SPY. So for example, you want to take, you know, a bull flag setup on another stock, but the SPY is, you know, rejecting resistance. You may want to be careful and vice versa. And also watch the VIX, guys. What is the VIX? Also known as uh, UVXY. You can trade it options on that. It's the volatility index. So when there's an uncertainty in the market, the VIX will rock it and the SPY will go down typically. And then when the, the VIX goes up and then comes crashing down, options premiums get IV crushed. So you can be right about the direction of a stock, but IV crush will still allow you to lose money. And SPY and UVXY usually work inverse each other. And the VIX, we're not going to go too deep into that because that's like a whole webinar in itself. But just be aware of it. Go do some research on your own. There's the implied volatility, the volatility index. Some call it the fear and greed index. And now putting it all together. So our guy here on the right, he's a detective. He's asking himself, what is the SPY doing? What is the UVXY doing? Are there any visible trend lines? Are we above or below the orb? Where are the key levels? You know, what is the 9 EMA doing? What's the volume like? What's the volatility like? What's the bid ask spread like? So he's going to use all the information available to him to make the best possible informed decision on when to enter and exit a trade. And just a couple closing thoughts. You know, always wait for the candles to close. It can be scary. You know, watching them wick crazy, but then sometimes, you know, they'll close back above your EMA. So just wait for the candles to close. I mean, obviously, you know, if it tanks, you know, get out, but typically wait for the candle to close. You know, play the bull and the bear side. I hear this all the time. Oh, I only play calls, I don't play puts. It doesn't make any sense. So, you know, they're really not all that different if you have to, you know, turn your chart upside down. They work the same. One goes up and one goes down. Avoid chop at all costs. My biggest losses in my own personal trading were from over trading chop, revenge trading chop. And limit yourself to just a few trades a day, no more than four or five. Quality setups only. And this is very important. Leave your directional bias at the door. Trade what's in front of you, not what you think should happen. Don't trade your feelings. Don't try to predict because we're not psychics. We need to make a plan based off of the chart. And if new information presents itself, we can switch our bias. But we use the chart as a way to analyze what's happening, not what we think should happen from people telling us from outside sources. So like the day, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine, you know, the market tanked, so you know, futures tanked overnight, so people, you know, they rushed into puts at open, and they got annihilated. The market ripped violently to the upside. They weren't playing the price action, they were playing what they feel, they felt should have happened. You know, we can use news and fundamentals, but only in confluence with our technical thesis. As day traders, we're really not worried about any outside sources except for the Fed. You know, we usually in and out of these trades in less than an hour so there's no point in paying any attention to anything else but price action yeah scale profits so when you're in profit sell a portion of your contracts so even if the trade ends up going against you in the other direction you can still exit the trade having made some profit so for a good <laughs> sorry for example if you're up 20 or 30 percent you can sell half and then set your stop loss at break even. So that way, you still made some money even if the trade ends up going in the other way. So a good place I like to scale is around 20-30%. So I'll sell half and then put my stop loss at break even. And then as my profits increase, 
I keep scaling more contracts. So when you're up 50%, you can take you know another one fourth of your contracts off, and then you can leave a runner. So you guarantee profit while also holding for more gains. So yeah, and you can leave a freebie. Just always scale profits, guys. Never let a green trade go red. And obviously, I don't mean if you're up five percent, it can't go red. You know, if you're up twenty, thirty percent, that's different. There should be no reason that trade ends up going red on you. Either you take small profit or you end up breaking even. And I can't reiterate this enough. Never trade something you cannot afford more than one contract of. Ideally, you should trade stocks you can buy four contracts of because you need to scale. So yeah, in conclusion, how to make consistent gains in trading options. How do we grow our small account? We go for small profits and we compound. We're going for base hits and not home runs. We need to keep our losses small and never let them spiral out of control. Let go of our ego because we will be wrong many, 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 many times. But that's okay because that's factored into our risk plan. We'll have red weeks. We'll even have red months. We just can't let it get to us and let it destroy us psychologically. And if you are on a losing streak, don't be afraid to take a break. You know, we need to take mental breaks all, all times. Sometimes, you know, it's just good for us. So don't be afraid to take a break. You know, if you're down horrendously on the day, just go walk your dog, go on a walk, do something productive, and then come back the next day refreshed. And know when to take the money and run. That comes with instinct. You know, if I'm up 50% or 100%, I might just take it, you know. Say, I'm happy with this. I mean, there's no reason to get out of a trade that's working, but we can always take the money and run. There's nothing wrong with that. No one ever went broke taking profits. They did go broke by not having a stop loss. You know, follow your rules. That's what they're there for. If they're good rules and you follow them, eventually the numbers will play out over the years. And trading can have four outcomes. We can win big, we can have a small win, a small loss, or a big loss. If we eliminate number four, we're well on our way to becoming profitable. And a couple of mindset things. I made these 12 small account affirmations. Just rules that we read to ourselves before we start trading at open because trading has so many rules. It can be hard to memorize them all at once. So if we say them to ourselves, they're internalized before we start trading. Only playing quality setups, not chasing it open. You buy what's appropriate for your account size, all things that we talked about. Cut your losses quickly when you're wrong. Go for base hits, not home runs. Stop over trading. Only trade where there's volume and liquidity. Don't FOMO into other traders' ideas and alerts, especially with no preparation. Don't let green trades go red. And it's okay to be wrong. You know, the size of our account does not reflect who we are as people, and there are more important things in the world than money. And we'll do our best to control our emotions. While it's not easy, it is a learned skill that we will continue to work on. And yeah, just never give up. Always keep at it. Keep on keeping on. You know, humans really aren't wired to see their net worth jump up and down hundreds, even thousands of dollars a day. So we have to train our brains to withstand that constant pressure. And I will be hosting a beginner boot camp at some point in the near future. So if you're interested in that, find me on Twitter or email me at soccercheese at gmail.com. Thank you guys so much for being here and checking out my video. I hope you guys learned a lot. Thank you so much.